who is the owner and founder of the Vocal Studio, TV Nest, down in Seattle. Uh, um, it's an internationally recognized voice training school for singing vocal techniques, public speaking, teacher training, and other vocal-related events. Robert is also the author and producer of the critically acclaimed vocal instruction training online course and book, The Four Pillars of Singing. Well, that's by the second slide. That's just <laughs> the TBS method, total, uh, the local studio method, is practiced in 175 countries around the world. Yes. Uh, awesome. Love Mr. Lucky's book has sold over 10,000 copies, and the numerous online courses are widely recognized as the most comprehensive home study courses ever produced for singers enjoyed by an estimated 100,000 students worldwide. In the past 10 years, he's presented master classes in over 12 countries. Robert is a master teacher with Fire Up Training, a sales training company that teaches corporate sales teams and keynote speakers how to present more effectively. He also runs the Fire Up Training Accent Coaching Program that helps executives to speak better English. Robert stays active as a vocalist, as a session singer in the Seattle region, and by participating in original projects and product demonstrations for sponsors. He's an active member of the National Association of Teachers of Singing, the Grammys, and the Voice Foundation. Robert, it's all yours. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. 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 Robert Costa needs to learn about maybe a short while. I'll work on that next time. Thanks a lot, Craig. Really appreciate it. Good, guy. Good to have you all here. Um, so um, I'm going to move fairly quickly, but one thing I want to do in this is I want it to be sort of an active session. I don't want to just do a data dump and, and move slides. There'll be moments in our presentation today where you'll see Q&A and that's when I really want you to be brave and raise your hand and ask questions and all of that. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, I'm going to tell a little personal story that I have about my own life and I think a phase that I went through that was sort of miserable and then I figure out a way to get out of it and I suspect that some of you might sort of be able to, uh, 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 you might be able to uh, identify with some of these feelings to one extent or another. And where we're really going to go is what I believe to be something that's super important for voice coaches. Um, and that is how do we take our skills and our talents, which are typically quite abundant, and get paid more for what we're doing? How do we, how do we not only that, but reach out and get to more students? How do we build more, more business? And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that, OK? Um, so here we go. That's me. We'll move forward real quick. Craig did a nice job with this. Um, I've got the voice studio, uh, vocal studio in Seattle, Washington. This is 175 countries, 100,000 students. It's sort of relevant to what's coming in the presentation. Um, this was accomplished through doing online courses. That is, um, teaching singers and public speakers how to public speak and sing better through my training techniques and methodology, which I'm not going to get into today. This is all about business. But you get numbers like that by scalability, through scalability, through um, uh, making online courses and some of the other things we're going to talk about today. So that is sort of relevant. Um, prior to, to Coming to Vancouver, I flew in from a Scandinavian country where I'm, I'm currently involved in doing some research for people that suffer from dysphagia, the inability to swallow. Um, I'm not a, an SLP. Um, I got roped into this thing. It's a really exciting opportunity to maybe, arguably, no offense, do something even more meaningful than teach people how to sing with the techniques that I've developed. My point that's relevant for you guys is, again, that opportunity came to me through online courses. It's when you have numbers like this, okay, that people, you get more eyes, more exposure, and then more opportunities come your way. 
Um, and there's a little bit about online courses and the fire train. We'll move forward. Oh, yeah, we've got some fun little slides. That's me doing stuff. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. One-on-one huh. -on -one private lessons is the only thing I do. All right? I have a little picture there of the voice coach who is maybe feeling a bit, well, I don't know. Um, any suggestions? Lonely. Anybody got any ideas there? Get all the train tracks. <laughs> Waiting. <laughs> Um, upset about the student that canceled and wasted time <laughs> on the book. Um, look, I know I'm not um, preaching to the choir here. Um, so next, for me personally, that was me. I'll go back. That's me. Okay? I've been doing this for about 18, 20 years. I wrote the book, the course, all that stuff. Pretty darn good coach. Do a good job. But what happened was, for me, what happened was, originally, voice coaching was something that I was, it was really super fun. It, it kind of fed my ego as well, and I got a lot of great feedback, and people loved it, and I know that all of you have had that experience, where there's this, it's really fun. And then, about halfway into my career so as a private instructor, I, I started realizing, wow, it's changing. I'm still doing it. It's still better than digging in a ditch or a stick in the eye. There's a lot of other things I would not want to do. However, I'm, gosh, I'm, something's wrong with me, maybe. What's wrong with me? What's the problem? I'm not really into it as much as I used to be. And I'm kind of feeling, kind of, I don't know, is it unhappy? If I start feeling kind of not, what's wrong? Why, what's, what's going on here? And then towards the end, I began to become fairly miserable, right? Why? Because I was frustrated with student cancellations. Uh, students tend to be, Honestly, it's going to be, at least ones I'm working with, relatively cheap, and not all of them practice. I'm just going to be really, you know, brutally honest with you guys. And for me, I don't know how you guys feel, but when I put my life's work, my heart and soul into helping somebody out, and they have a program, and they come back week after week, and they don't really do any work, where's that headed? You know, they want to know that you're leaving a lasting, a lasting result. And I think that probably that factor probably changes and is different for different studios. But just say for me, a studio working with a lot of CCM people, a lot of sort of contemporary rock people, I was dealing a lot with that. So it was sort of sort of sucking my soul a little bit. Alright. It's beginning to feel like I'm not being paid for what I'm worth. Alright? Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna suggest that everybody in here. Everybody in here is a talented, knowledgeable voice coach. In fact, a lot of you know about uh, 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 vocal health issues and things. I'm quite impressed by, by the talent and knowledge in the room when it comes to the Nats events. But I'm just going to take a, take a guess. If you're not, that, that you'd be getting more for your knowledge. Right? I, th I think that every single one of you should be making more than 60 bucks an hour. I'm just going to be really honest with you. That's what I want to do this morning. Okay. Uh, I was beginning to feel like the professional one on was not meeting my full potential. All right? I wanted to, I felt to do more. I had more, more to offer, and I needed to make more money. Okay? So, the thing I used to love to be proud of became my biggest problem. And it took me about two or three years to figure out, do the soul searching and figure out what the heck is going on. Why am I so miserable? And I realized, I realized, my point in the slide is I realized, man, the very thing that I used to love and be really proud of and have a big ego about and, and everybody was, and was having a lot of fun has somehow turned into the very thing that is making me miserable. Now, I want to preface this by saying I still teach. I, do, I still do one-on-ones. And I'm not saying don't do one-on-ones. I want to make that real clear. That's not what I'm recommending. Um, but for me, it's one day a week, like four or five students, just to keep my saw sharp. All right? And the other things I'm gonna show you what I'm doing is, you know, that you can do too. Um, we'll give us another thing, another, another talk, another perspective on what you can do as a voice coach. How many of you are familiar with this book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? Fantastic. Um, who can tell us what the premise is for Rich Dad, Poor Dad? The general, just the general basic premise. Does anybody feel confident to share that? No? Right. 
I'll, I'll tell you. So the, the basic premise for Rich Dad Poor Dad is essentially um, Robert Kiyosaki, when he grew up, he had two dads. His real dad, and then um, a, a stepdad. And his real dad was poor dad. His real dad um, uh, worked to make money. His stepdad worked to build businesses that are scalable. That make money. Now, when I say scalability, do you guys understand what I'm talking about? Okay. There's a slide coming on that. It's really super important. And that's key to what I'm talking about today. I want, I want to help you. I'm here to help you guys. I want you to be thinking about how you can get scalable in your business. Okay, so I started, when I realized, oh, this is why I'm miserable, okay, how do I fix it? I'm talking to a few mentors and what have you, I realized, okay, I need to be thinking about scalability. How do I make, as a voice coach, how do I make myself scalable? All right? Scalability means I put one unit of, of energy, one hour of time and energy, and instead of getting $100 back or $60 back, instead of trading time for money, I put in the time, the effort, the talent, one time, one, one, one unit of energy, and it, and it grows. And, and I get more than one unit back. Does this make sense to you guys? That's what scalability means. When business people are talking about scalability, that's more or less what they're talking about. They're not in the business of, I trade you an hour of time, an hour of my life, I'll never get back, and you give me a hundred bucks, thank you very much. Mm -mm. I'll put an hour of my time and talent and energy into helping you, and as a result, I can end up maybe, maybe getting 100,000 students in 175 different countries. So scalability is where we're going, all right? So I realized I've got to find a way to get scalable as a voice coach. By the way, that's not easy. As a voice coach, I, like, I, I know some of you might be feeling this. I did too. And some of you that are sort of following me, and getting what I'm, you're getting at what I'm getting at, what you might be thinking right now is, okay, I get scalability, yeah, sounds great, but I'm just a voice coach. I mean, no offense, but how do I do that as a voice teacher? Well, I'll show you. Anyways, <laughs> poor dad works to make money, rich dad works to build scalable businesses. And then, um, here's what happened when I finally realized what I needed to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 teacher, poor teacher. <laughs> I just submitted my uh, my uh, uh, my abstract for the TVF thing um, later in the year, and I'm calling it rich teacher, poor teacher. <laughs> All right, what does scalability mean? I just explained it. Um, anybody can you, can you tell me um, what I just explained in your own words? Scalability. Someone step up. The uh, set up for a system wherein, after um, giving one singular amount of energy, or we'll just say a single amount of capital, I guess. Capital of time, and capital, capital of energy. energy. Yeah, capital. Could, could be $100. Could be the same amount of return. Yes, right. Okay. One to many, one unit of time, one product, one investment that can grow to many. All right. When if you put a hundred dollars in Amazon.com stock, actually it's like twelve hundred dollars. You put twelve hundred dollars in Amazon.com stock, and then five years from now, that twelve hundred dollars is worth, you know, that that, that share is two thousand dollars a share. That's scalability. One unit and it grows. All right. So what do we do? To get scalability as a voice coach. Now we're going to start moving into the ideas. I'm just again, I'm not going to get into the the minutia of how to set up an online course and get the traffic flowing and do marketing funnels and, and reputation management. I'm not going to get into all that stuff. All that stuff is important. If any of you are interested really in looking into this, I can help you offline. Um, I'll give you my contact information at the end. I'll be happy to talk to you when you get back to Seattle. And I can consult with you on how to build an online course, how to do these things. All right, so we're just going to go over the ideas. Anybody have any ideas on how do we, other than, well, it's not scalable, right? Private lessons aren't scalable. So how about some ideas on how we can be scalable, how we can scale 
with our voice teacher skills and talent and experience set. Anybody have some ideas? Write a book. Write a book. Right, good. Write a book. And then what do you do with the book? You, you market it. You put it on Amazon.com. And you put in some marketing um, techniques that allow you to get your book out to a lot of people. That's a great. Any fans? Write a book. What else? Online. YouTube videos. YouTube videos. YouTube videos. That's great. Yes, YouTube videos are a way of getting scalability. Absolutely. I have a, I have a YouTube channel. It's got 300 videos in it. Um, it. It's not the perfect scalability, I'll tell you, but it is scalability in the sense that it doesn't immediately pay you, but what it does do, if you set it up right, is it drives traffic to your website where, they, where people can then do what? Like Buy your book. <laughs> all right, so a lot of the numbers I showed you earlier, the 175, the 100,000 students, all of that, a lot of those, um, those numbers are, some of it, are coming from traffic from YouTube. Great. All right. What else? Any other ideas in the back of the room in the corner? I saw somebody raise their hand back there. That was yeah, that was uh, oh yeah. Well, I, that was YouTube videos, but also podcasts would be another one. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> podcast is kind of like podcasting is sort of like uh, <laughs> sort of like a YouTube, isn't it? It's creating media, creating content, and then distributing it out for as many eyes to see as possible building up a fan base or people that like you and follow you. And essentially, that, that model is the business of becoming an, uh, an influencer or influencer marketing type person. Yes? Robert, what is the relationship or the, uh, between scalability and marketing? Because what I'm hearing, I mean, I'm supposed to is a, is, a, is a thing that gets generated and can go out to multiple yep. people. And, but then the YouTube really is a marketing tool towards helping sell the book or helping. So, so can, you, can you address, I think, there's, I think there's some confusion. We think of things being a scalable thing, but in fact they're just marketing things. So. Okay, so yeah, that's a good question. So, so what we're talking about, what I'm gonna show you in the next slide or two, are um, products. A book is a product. I don't have a, a slide on books, because I have a book, I probably should. I, I probably should put that on there. I'm gonna talk about some different products. So, so we, scalability is sort of a, an abstract concept that just means I put in one element of energy, time, and talent, 100 bucks, whatever it may be, and it grows into, it grows like a weed. Okay, that's what scalability means. Um, but scalability is something that we would plug into, that we would that we would um, um, invest our marketing efforts to get the scalability to sell a product. Does this make sense? We start with a product, okay, that is scalable. We start with a product or a service that is scalable, one-on-one -on -one lessons or not unless you're in front of a class. Unless you're only doing master classes, okay? All right, and then, and then we, we do marketing techniques, which I don't have time to get into today, but I'm, I'm an expert in it, and I'd be happy to consult you on some of that, to drive the traffic to get the scalability to move. Does that make sense? There's a lot that needs to be done, but all I want to cover today is really the product ideas. Start with an idea. Start with the book, okay? Any other ideas for scalability? Book, YouTube is a marketing channel that is scalable, it's brilliant, and you guys really should really seriously consider it. Somebody over here? Yeah, well, I always teach a few classes in between the private students. Okay. Does that, does that work in this model? It's possible. If the class looks like this, and everybody's paid 100 bucks, that's scalable. Is it like that? Is it a big group of people? Pretty big. <laughs> okay, well. Ten. Okay, no, that's great. That's great. Yes, that would be a form of scalability. Ten yeah. one rather than one. Well, I, 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 I sort of look at classes as being marketing and recruiting. Yep. Because out of them, then they show up in my studio for private lessons and it just sort of perpetuates the brand. That's very helpful. Can I make this kick? Do you yeah. charge people even 10 bucks to come in? Oh, yeah. Okay, then that's that's then I think that's a good a decent scalable idea. Okay. Yeah. But let's but I want to notice that you've created a scalable event or a business experience for everybody.
that then funnels them into a non-scalable business. Right? <laughs> now, there's nothing I'm going to point out today that I haven't done myself that didn't make me absolutely miserable. I figured out, so believe me, I'm not trying to pick on you. And it's hard, it's really difficult as a voice coach to get out of that mindset of I give you an hour of my time, you give me some money, and we're done, and there's really no other way to do this. It's, it's difficult. But I, I, I just, out of my heart, truly, I, this is the voice coach in me. And we all have really super big hearts as voice coaches. And we want to help. And I want to help my colleagues. I want to help you to, to be careful about that. Sometimes I get on the private voice teacher group out of Facebook. Some of you guys are familiar with it. It's a <laughs> big I'm, I'm a bit vocal out there. And, but it's really from a heart, from a good heart. It really is. I, 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 all the time I see, I see, I, I, okay, I spent three weeks putting together a, a, a recital for my students. Everybody came in. Everybody had a really great time. And at the end, um, I had to clean up a huge mess, pay for the facilities, da, da, da. what am I doing wrong? And I'm like, did you charge anybody? No. Okay. Uh, like there are, there's elements, that, like in a sense, it could have been a good scalable idea, but there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a fear to ask for your, your students and their parents and people to pay you for your time. <laughs> You need to be paid for your time, <laughs> all of you. For no, and be really, really guard against allowing yourself, guard against allowing your big heart to get in the way from taking care of business. And that happens with voice coaches. It happened with me too. That's part of why I didn't understand what was going on. Partly, honestly, up a little bit too, my heart was too big. In a sense, Giving too much to the point where everybody, everybody was getting a wonderful service. Everybody, else, everybody was happy. The person that was the least happy in the room was the guy that was giving, the teacher. That can't be the case. I want you guys, I want my colleagues, you pay for what you're worth and be happy. Make more go. All right. Where's the scalability for a voice coach? Book. Excellent. Marketing through YouTube and podcasts. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I'm going to talk about Skype lessons, virtual lessons with Skype. Something you guys have heard about. A lot of you probably doing that. How many people are doing virtual lessons with Skype? Well, that's yep. Up. Great. If you are not doing Skype lessons because, honestly, you're sort of a little afraid of the technology or you sort of feel like, well, there's no possible way that I can teach a student what I do over a Skype and you sort of hanging on to that, I, I, I want to do you a favor and I want to invite you to let go of that. You got to let go of that. It's killing you. It's just simply not true. I was one of the first coaches to do Skype lessons on the planet. Like, I've been doing it for like 15 years. And it works, I'll get to that. It works. Teaching people over Skype works. Is it exactly the same as one-on-one? -on -one? Is, it, is, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it as good as one-on-one? -on -one? No, but it's about 90% is good. About 90%. I've taught teachers all over the world on Skype. People I've never personally met, only on Skype. 40 hours of training on my method. They're sitting in Hong Kong. They're sitting in Spokane. They're sitting in Germany. They're sitting in Norway. Okay, and it works. So that's a form of scalability. How? How is, where does the scalability come from in this? It's still a one-on-one -on -one lesson. That might be a little confusing. It's still one-on-one. -on -one. But, but where is the scalability in this idea? Market size. Your method. The, method. the scalability in my method or your method is when we do um, teacher, we, we, we franchise it through teacher training. Um, yes, if I'm doing a teacher training, but not the answer I'm looking for. That's a good answer. But somebody else said it back here? Market size. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, last time I checked, Earth is a pretty big market. <laughs> Earth is a pretty big market. Does anybody know how many English speakers are around the world? 780 million. And that's probably a low estimate. That doesn't account for people that can, 
that sort of like in Germany and France that can kind of speak English but and, and, and get along with it, but aren't really great at it. That's just the frontline primary English speaking populace, 780 million people. So let's call it mm, 1.2 billion. That's a lot of students. Okay? And by the way, when you have that kind of demand, and you have that kind of market, yeah, you have a bigger demand, bigger market, and you're only teaching, what, 10 or 20 hours a week, what does that mean that you can do to your pricing? Yeah, Damn rights. You charge more. I start charging more. Okay? So, um, by the way, in terms of technology for virtual lessons, Skype works perfectly fine. You do not, you know, so before I get to this, any questions about Skype? Uh, I, I teach on Zoom sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I can be interested in your careers and do, and also how do you deal with the time delivery? Okay, great. Um, I also use Zoom. It tends to be a little bit more for sort of corporate-y stuff. I have a Zoom account, but you can teach on Zoom. Frankly, Zoom is superior to Skype. I mean, I mean, Product to product, in terms of features and advantages, Zoom is a little bit, is, is better. But there's a problem with Zoom. It only, they only allow you 45 minutes before they make you pay. Yeah. Exactly. That's a problem for me, because I offer uh, full hour lessons. Um, um, so I've just been sticking with Skype. Um, and people are a little bit more familiar with Skype. You guys know darn well, all of you know darn well, that you went out to some of you new students and you, and you surveyed 10 of your students. You said, okay, we're gonna do virtual lessons. We're gonna do Skype or Zoom. You don't, and we all know that most of the students are going to go, let's go Skype, because that's what I'm familiar with. So that's another part. Zoom is a little bit more abstract. Um, there's another question somewhere. I was to say, I use Zoom a lot too, but you only have to pay if you're doing a group lesson for 40 minutes. It's unlimited for one-on-one, -on -one, just that far. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It was the, the time delay, so I was, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you. If that's the case, then Zoom is equal to Skype, provided that, you know, but I think that you'd want to sort of go, I would be inclined to go with what my, is easiest for my students to understand. I know you guys feel the same way. If you don't want your students fussing with the technology, um, time delay. I have an online calendar, a posted calendar. Um, you might want to write this down. Scheduledonce.com. Scheduledonce.com. It's not the only uh, calendar um, scheduling software. It's just one of many. I use it. It's pretty darn good. What happens is, is you create a calendar. I create a calendar, scheduledonce.com. And there's a link to my calendar in the signature of my emails. There's a link to my calendar on my website, at the footer, and at the top on the main navigation bar. I put the, I put the link to schedule lessons with me everywhere I can. All right, so they can't miss it. They click on that, and what they do is they go out to a web-based interface. And what's cool is the software recognizes where they're sitting. If they're sitting in Norway, it recognizes that they're nine hours ahead of Seattle. If they're sitting in Seattle, it'll broadcast Seattle time. So basically what happens is they see preset available hours that I've inputted into the calendar, just like booking time with the dentist. And, and so if it's in Australia and I'm teaching on Fridays, if I'm looking at the same um, book, book time in Seattle, it says Friday. If my student is in Australia and they're looking at the same time, they're going to be on their calendar because of the software. They're going to be looking at at Saturday afternoon. Okay, that's how it works. It's all in the technology. You don't have to fuss with it. It's all automated and everything. Okay. And by the way, when they by the way they they book time, that software sends out a little notification email. Okay, your lesson is at a certain time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And down in, in that information, I put in the link to the sky and everything they need to get going. So it's sort of this chain of communications that leads them down a path to get set up and, and, and going. I just wondered, have you played with or looked at voicelessons.com, which is the paid platform yeah. um, that deals with the lag in between uh, the student yeah. and the, the teacher? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Have you tried? I've because I've done a demo on it, and it's kind of cool because it's got uh, areas where you can create archives of warm-up lessons and, um, and, and 
in, in such a way where there's no lag between the students. It's got, um, it's got uh, libraries of recordings that students can sing to and yeah. you know, stuff like that. Anyway, I'm just, I, I think it's kind of, I think it's kind of cool. I, so I, I, I know the founder personally. Sorry? I know the founder personally. Okay. I've worked with it personally. Some of the ideas in that app were, were provided for mom. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. um, what I want, I'm going to be careful with this, but based on my personal experience, I just want to say this. You don't need to spend money on a special piece of software to do, to do virtual lessons. It's not necessary. What we have here is, in my, in my opinion, just a better mousetrap. Maybe, maybe. Mm -hmm. I did try it once and I lost my student because we couldn't get it figured out. And she never came back. You do not need to spend money or give money to somebody who's never been a voice coach before in their lives, all right, to, to do virtual lessons. Skype is free and it works easier. And if you want files and archive a file, put put files in a Dropbox and give and give links to your Oh, students. that's what I do. I do that's that what I've been doing for yeah. years. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw that solution, the first time I saw that solution three years ago was presented to me, and I was some, or like a, like an early adopter. It was presented to me. The very first thing I said was, "I'm never going to use this. <laughs> okay. I'm never going to use this. I don't need this." Oh, I'm going to be up with the wagon. It's all cool, and so the teacher's going to love it. I'm like, "Have you ever taught a lesson?" No. Okay, well then you don't really know what you're talking about, then you need this. Can I ask a story in terms of the technology then, because my computer's got a really crappy sound card. I have actually get better um, results using my phone, the sound is better in my phone. Um, so on there, the student end, what kind of microphones are you recommending? And on the teacher end or sound card, like I was thinking about getting an external sound card for my don't phone. Don't fuss with any of that. These days, any lap, new, fairly new laptop, I mean, let's be honest, if you're running no, mine, from mine, mine doesn't, like, honestly, I get, like, really terrible distortion, like, through my laptop. On my phone, I don't get that. Okay, is your laptop old? No, no, it just has a crappy sound card. It's a, it's a, it's about three years old, it's an i7, it's got, um, it's just a crappy sound card. I think that's an individual issue. Mm -hmm. um, I, I run off Macs, I ran off PCs, and I have all these students that are running off you know, all kinds of different systems. Mm -hmm. um, there are, uh, I, I don't have any technology problems with my students. So no external microphones, you just use what's in the laptop? You don't need an external microphone either. Okay. And if you've been told, if you've been told that you need to go out and buy an external microphone and plug in, and get like a big fuzzy thing or whatever, you don't need that. You don't need it. It's, it's junk. You're just adding uh, technology layers that are absolutely not necessary. For, for, for virtual lessons, what I do, what I've been doing for 10 years, is I download and install Skype. I get my, my student schedules through the calendar. They download and install Skype. We connect on Skype. We become Skype friends or whatever they call it. And at the designated time, I turn it on, they turn it on. I use this camera built into my laptop, it's perfectly fine. And I use the microphone built into my laptop, perfectly fine. You do not need a special USB thing that comes up and all that. Don't do that. It's a, don't do that. You're making it a lot more complicated. It's not necessary. The little mics built inside the system and the little cameras built inside the most modern laptops are perfectly fine. And I want to sort of feel obligated to protect you guys. Don't waste time and money on, on external mice and software that doesn't, that you really don't need. Is there a difference between having a CCM lesson and having a classical lesson in terms of the quality of sound that you hear? I don't think so. What might that be? Usually in the, in the classical, you're looking for more overtones and that kind of um, the formant and all that stuff. I teach formants. Yesterday, um, um, and, and that's not necessarily what you're looking for in the CCM. I disagree with you. I teach formants. There's 100 pages of formant study in my book in my course. I teach formants. Sound colors, how to hear vowels, how to modify the at at A4, <laughs> all that stuff. It's not just a classical singing thing. We listen, I, I teach my students every day to listen to colors, the, the sound colors. 
to know the difference between forward edging valves and curving valves and neutral valves and all that. And all of that, is, those subtleties you can get on your yes. computer. Yes. Mic. Yeah. 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 Really, you can. It's perfectly fine. It might take a little dip, or it might take a little while to hear the difference between um, um, mm -hmm. through your speakers or your headphones than than and get used to that difference from live. Mm -hmm. But you can you can hear all those subtleties. Yeah, and work with it. Yeah, I'd like to add a thing to that too. Yeah, I completely agree. Where I'm losing on my sound card is the upper and the higher harmonics. So when my daughter, when I'm working with my daughter, works down to the high soprano, it just moves the total top. But I'm working in the middle. I can I can hear I'm on my crappy sound card. I can hear the differences and learn to hear it. But it's uh, yeah, well, that distortion out there. Is just we do with vowel modification and all kinds of narrow vowels and open vowels. It's not we're not just you know just playing rock star. I mean it's legitimate. I'm going to speak later, but I wanted to just clarify exactly what you said. And I always tell people to use headphones. If you're going to use a speaker in your laptop, you're not going to get it. You need to have headphones. Unless I also land into a PA, which you might do too. And that's I plug into a PA. Right. And I, 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 I'm, I'm using headphones is a good idea. It will get you closer to the sound. But in the end, I agree with Craig. In the end, it might take a week or two to kind of get used to it. That's fair. But 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 you get to a point where you can do that. It's not it's not the impossible thing. It's not that big of a deal. And I just want to make sure that you guys don't feel like it's a big deal. It's just not because if you're sort of hung up on that then you're missing the opportunity to get more students and get more business because of something that's that because of a belief that really isn't it wasn't totally correct. And nobody's paying me to be here today. I want to help you. Okay. Any other questions on the Skype lessons? I know it's a popular topic. Just keep it simple. Use something that's free. Don't need fancy mics. Turn it on. Get used to it. It's all good. I do like the idea of that. Um, the reason I wouldn't use headphones for me is one, I'm plugging into a P system, PA system, and two, two, um, I don't want something bulky and hot and muggy on my head for six hours. I use earbuds. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. But I, when I had a studio that I had, I'm teaching in a different room, I had a room that had, I could blast my, my PA, but currently I'm not in a room where I can do that, so earbuds solve the problem. But I do like the PA. And my husband is a drum teacher and he uses the PA exactly. Yeah. You can do it, so. Yeah, so can you? Yeah. All right, well, fun, I'm fun. All right, so this is a screenshot from an online course marketplace. It's, a, it's not my website, it's a place, sort of my partner in a way. It's a, it's a place where you go, people that have online courses go and they upload their videos and their content and then they teach their topic, okay? And that could be how to make chocolate chip cookies. It could be how to code, how to do Python coding. It could be how to, how to sing and train. It's, it's anything under the world. And I have, um, there's actually more than this. This is three of nine courses that I have on one particular platform. And that doesn't include what's out of my own personal website. All right? Um, something that might be interesting to you guys, 220, 22.5 hours of content, um, 3,580 ratings, um, and this. I didn't want to be rude. I blocked that out. But that is, um, that's, that's six figures. That's over $150,000 in passive income. Passive income in a year. By scaling. By doing the same darn thing that I do in front of the Skype lesson every Friday. The same thing. But creating some video content and uploading it to a platform and doing online work. I need to get my ratings up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> my ratings are a little low, and be honest with you, you guys might think this is sort of funny. My ratings are a little low, a little, that's not, actually not low, but it could be a little bit higher. But it's one, one reason for that is because when students come in and buy my course, they're confronted with a real training program. You know, so, so they, they're sort of expecting to like get a file downloaded and an experience that's super, super basic that isn't really going to get them what they need, and I ask them to learn about formats and <laughs> vowels and things and stuff. So, uh, it's not very good. All right? So, 
So we're going along. We're going the right direction. There we are. Okay. So online courses, Q and A on the online courses. Do you guys have any questions about online courses? It's sort of a new idea, but it's big and it's coming. I mean, it's here already. Any questions about how that is and how that works? It's the best solution that I'm showing you today in terms of scalability. It's the most scalable. No? Any concerns about it? I've got a question. Uh -huh. How much of a percentage are they taking from your income? No, that's a good question. Depends on the platform. Okay. This particular platform, um, 50%. 50? Five yep. zero? Yep, five zero. So is there an advantage to making sure that your own website has the capacity to do the modules yourself so you're not losing 50% of the income? Here's what I'm paying for. I'm paying 50% into the partnership, into the marketplace. It's worth every darn dime. Did you see the numbers? Mm -hmm. It's worth it. What they do is they're putting $100,000 a month into marketing my course. Mm -hmm. They're driving traffic to my course, traffic I would never, ever get. It doesn't matter how amazing my podcast and YouTube channel is, I would never get the kind of traffic and eyes on my product um, without their help. I mean, it's a major corporation, it's like a, you know, you know, a, a 20 million, 20, oh, shit, I don't even know, $15 billion company. They've got marketing budget because they're taking a cut, right? Substantial cut. A substantial cut, yeah. Um, that's not the only. That's not the only um, cut that they take. There's other percentages based on how the sale is made. Um, that would be the most. So there are certain situ certain purchases that are made of my course off the platform where I get seventy five percent, where they where they don't touch it quite as much. So it's okay to like market have the same course marketed in multiple places. That's not an issue. It's not an issue. Okay. Good question. Now. Um, yeah. What's your process when you're developing a course like this? Like, right now, like, I've been kind of toying with this idea for a while, but I'm like, do I need to go and purchase a bunch of courses so that I, because I don't really even know kind of what the structure of like a typical online course would look like. So I don't really know what process to take to start like, okay, well, and on average there's 22 hours of material or no. five hours of material, you know, I'm not even sure where to begin as far as like how to structure the on thing. On average, that, that's really more to the average of most courses, that's a little bit freakish. <laughs> that's um, an obsession. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is just a little bit more what's going on. Great question. There is a, a way to do it. There is a learning curve involved in, okay, how do I plan? How do I, how do I make a curriculum and plan? Like, what's my course gonna be? What am I gonna talk about? Am I gonna be like everybody else, or what's my special sauce? Mm -hmm. What's my deal? There's a plan for that, yeah. curriculum plan. That I have, that I, and I'm not pitching you a cons cons consultation service, I'm only saying that I do offer that to other mm -hmm. online course producers. It's another business that I'm involved in. I learned how to do this, and now I'm helping others learn how to do it. Answering your question, there's a planning process, and spreadsheets and things, and sort of a thought, sort of a soul-searching work worksheet that you go through to get an answer to that, and then you build a curriculum. Then there's the production. Um, lavaliers, uh, cameras, um, teleprompters, and all the gear that's involved to make a nice, beautiful production. Then there's implementation. Platform, just simply upload the videos and make the landing page and make it all look pretty. And then there's more. So there's four steps in the process. And I can teach you that if you're interested. <laughs> I can help you. I'm in Seattle, I'll give you my contact information. That's what I'm doing, is helping people do this. And so um, I have five courses online, nine on this platform. The other four are, are collaboratives where I'm partnering with another team. Yeah, so uh, you just mentioned those four aspects to creating an online course. So let's say yeah, you had 12 minutes of time to come up with those four aspects that you put into this course, and then the course becomes a product and gets put out on online. And, and then how much, let's say your second one, um, is there a continuing level of um, interaction between you and the people that take that course? 
that is also some of your time put into the course as an ongoing thing? Great question. Yes, it's a little bit of what we call reputation management and a little bit of customer service. Yes, it's a touch. Okay. It's like two hours a week. Okay. The people, these people that are doing this, I have to respond to the reviews, and then there's an email, there's like some built-in email systems that you can send out to, to <laughs> announce a new promotion or, or um, stir up the mud and get people talking. You can, you can send out some, e some internal little emails and some simple things. So the, all, you do all that in two hours a week? I do, no, I uh, pay an intern to help me. But I used, I, I, I used to do it all. But so it's called two to four hours a week to maintain the course. Yeah, to maintain. That's, that's a good question. And yeah, there's a little bit of work involved, a little bit of admin, a little bit of admin involved, but it's certainly worth it. Yeah. Do you, when you're creating more than one course, do you feel like you're targeting a similar audience for all of your courses? Or like, you know, like do you sort of have a client and type of client in mind and then creating multiple courses for that client? Or are you thinking about multiple clients and creating courses like geared at great different clients? Great question, great question. This was my first attempt. It's the most successful one. And that was just, this is everything I know about singing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a lexicon. And it was for everybody. And I sort of didn't know any better. Now, going into 2020 and the plans that I have, and, and to some extent this and this, you see how this is a little bit more focused? Mm -hmm. It's warm-ups, it's not everything. It's warm-ups. This is like content for master classes, like repurposed into a course. So the short answer is, the best answer is um, be targeted, do research, and, and, and make a course that, 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 that focuses on a niche or somebody or something unique that you're doing That'd be my advice. And then would you um, target that same person with an, like a second course, or would you target somebody if else sold, with a second well, course? Well, if it sold well, mm -hmm. yes. If it mm -hmm. didn't sell so well, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And I invite you to look, do some soul searching. Part of the theme of what I'm doing today is do some soul searching and realize, you know, voice teacher isn't the only thing I can do. Imagine that. <laughs> that's that's a big part of big part of what of, the, of, of what I'm talking about here. Voice teacher isn't the only thing I can do. You know, what my next course is going to be in January. I'm done with singing courses. I've said everything I need to say, pretty much, unless it's in a partnership with somebody else that can speak another language. I'm going to start doing public speaking courses <laughs> and presentation courses and get to a business crowd. Because of that process that I was talking about earlier with the sad person on the railroad, because I'm, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I feel so liberated. I'm like, yes, I, I, don't, I don't only have to be a voice coach. It's, it's lovely, I, I, I've enjoyed it, it's done well, and I got a big heart, and, you know, but uh, I can do other things. I have other skills and other experiences in my life, and I want you guys to, to think about that. Right? We're not sort of just like only voice coaches. Now, I'll never forget it. I was in my car, commiserating, fishing, feeling crappy, in my Jeep, in downtown Seattle, and one of my mentors, who's this successful serial um, entrepreneur guy from Microsoft, who was a student and also became my friend, I remember I was on the phone, I'll never forget it, he said to me, look, being a voice coach is not the only thing you can do. It's not the only thing you can do. Click. <laughs> you got sick of hearing me bitch, you know, dumping on him. He's like, I'm like, that's funny. He's funny. Any other questions? Is this helpful for you guys? Okay. All right, I sure hope so. All right, here's that. Okay. Where's the skill for voice coach? Here's another one. The private lessons. How many people get emails every single day? Hey, Robert, you know, I just started seeing the warm up scale, and, and, and can you listen to it for me and give me some feedback on whether or not that's going well? Am I doing it right? Uh, who gets an email like that every single day? Seriously? Okay, this really? You don't get emails from your students asking you advice on if you're doing it right or if they can listen to you? It's not something to go on. 
<laughs> okay, maybe maybe that's a maybe that's an outcome of being sort of online. But I get I get a lot of hey, you mind listening to me do my thing, da da da, work on your scalp. Hey, you mind listening to me see? And and it can really suck up your time. So what I want to show you guys here is a service. I don't own a service. It's not mine. I don't. I'm not getting anything from this. I'll give you information at the end of the presentation. Where you can do really cool um, video reviews. And it's super simple. I tried one just the other day. Somebody paid me $40. And they can, I, I watched a cute little video of my students singing for like two minutes. And then I pushed a green button and talked back and made a video. Hey, that's pretty good. I think you should, you know, thin out a little bit more in the vocal folds, add a little bit more cry mode. And, Tune in a little bit more half on E4 and get the, you know, I gave her my advice and then I hit got and I hit stop. It, it, it took me four minutes. I made 40 bucks. And she loved it. And then she ran out to my Facebook group and posted it about, oh, this is the greatest experience ever. So in terms of some free reviews, other than other than private lessons for an hour, there might be there might be an opportunity to do something like this. And I, I threw this into my presentation only because it's sort of new. I'm, I'm, I'm trying it, but it's it's not the perfect definition of scalability, but the fact that it only that it only takes you 30 seconds is sort of another way of getting scalability out of out of the one-on-one. -on -one. It's on an hour, it's 10 minutes. So it's it's got a high it's got a high margin to it. Next. Uh, do you have any questions about that? Okay. Next, you don't need special software to do reviews. You don't need to pay somebody else to set up reviews and review interface. That service, but that service I just showed you is free. <laughs> it's free. You set it up, it's free. Okay. So I'm wrapping this up. Scalability. Um, one more is private uh, public speaking. We, we touched on that. I'm going to race for a little bit. I'm running out of time, but we touched on that, right? Doing events, speaking. Okay. And um, how do you do that? You get on the phone. <laughs> get on the phone, you ask for the gig. This back here, where do I go? No, up there. This guy right here, this is four weeks ago in Berlin. <laughs> Speaking at the conference for the same company where I do the online courses, the same company. 200 of the world's best online course producers in the world. Um, and. And, and I just, I just here, here's, here's something I want to share with you. I was, I was just going to be a participant. I was getting the emails from them. Um, hey, come on, come to our event in Berlin. And I was over going to go, just as a participant. Hey, come to our event in Berlin. Um, it's 300 bucks, and you know we're going to have a great time, da, da, da. And I, and I, I, and I hit reply, and it was basically, to whom it may concern, I have no idea who this is going to. Four well knowing it's probably just going into it, just a bottomless pit. But if there's any chance that somebody on your speaking schedule um, cancels, or if you have any interest in these ideas down here, that I'm talking about, you know, a, a lecture about speaking to the camera, something about vocal, vocal health for, for online course producers, I'm not making up ideas. This, this, this. <laughs> Let me know. Boom. Threw up a prayer, walk away from it, sort of laughed about it. Next thing I know, got somebody's attention and they pulled me in and I'm like a keynote guy. <laughs> you know, and I, my, me and my girl, I had, to buy, I had to buy jackets and everything. <laughs> I was, was like, got the cool pointy. You know? <laughs> so my point, the lesson there is, um, we, could, we could do a whole hour on how to get public speaking when we're running out of time. But I guess from my own personal experience, my story, just ask for the gig. Just ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of you are speaking, you probably do that already. Okay. Okay, our summary. One on ones are not scalable. Offer Skype lessons. Make online courses. That's actually the best option right there. These are the two best. This is the best one right here. This is the future too. Don't be surprised if NASA comes out one day and says we're doing online courses. It's coming. It's coming. It's darn right. It's coming, and better be ready for it. Offer video reviews, and of course, presenting is no-brainer if you can get the gig. 
That's me. I don't want to go into my friend's time. He's kind enough to videotape my presentation. That's what I have. Any other questions about anything we've gone over today? If, if at a minimum, at a minimum, I hope that what you can take away from this is just start thinking about you don't only have to be a voice coach, you have all kinds of skills, and even in the, and even if you want to keep being a voice coach, just doing one-on-ones is not the only thing you can do. And I just want you to walk away from this presentation today just thinking, how can I get scalable? How can I scale whatever it is I do? And there were some ideas that came up today that I didn't even have on my presentation that are forms of scalability. Um, if, if you're interested in getting more value out of your time and your talent, making more income at this, and getting access to more students and more opportunities. It can only happen with scalability. I'm available for every one of you um, after this, or I'm going to go to the hotel, or you can contact me back in Seattle, and I'm, I would be thrilled and honored to help any of you too answer more questions or help you with this stuff. And that's my presentation.